Hello everyone, welcome to your next section. In this one, we're gonna be talking about random forest models. Random forest models are a really fantastic machine learning method that is used uh, for all sorts of problems because it tends to be really robust, meaning that you can use random forest both when you have categorical data, as well as when you have some sort of like floating, uh, you know, uh, ratio or interval kind of number that, uh, you know, is like a real number. So you can use random forests for basically any kind of machine learning problem. Uh, they happen to be very, very useful for all kinds of problems and they tend to be one of the best performers. Uh, they're super useful for every, for essentially every problem, almost any problem that you can think of for that data scientist uh, um, explores, you could technically, you could probably model using some sort of random forest uh, machine learning algorithm in some way, shape, or form. However, it's probably not going to be the most optimized or ideal model for any, like for a, sp let's say like a specific problem. So it's a really great model to learn after learning about linear regression because it's kind of your first jump into machine learning and you can use this one for all kinds of different stuff. Uh, one of the downsides of random forest models, however, is that uh, they tend to take up a lot of memory. So they're, they're very, they're very heavy to use. So uh, what you're going to learn uh, is that you're going to learn a high-level explanation of what a decision tree is. You're going to learn how uh, we create a decision tree and what the process of um, creating like one tree in a forest is like. Uh, we're going to talk about the cost function for decision tree making. So um, it's not really called a cost function in... Um, when you when you talk about random forest modeling, uh, we don't really use the term cost function because uh, of how the process of how random forest models work. However, I think this the talking about uh, if we wanted to use universal language for all of the machine learning models, I'm going to be showing you throughout this course the closest thing to a cost function for decision trees is the Gini index. And we'll go through what that Gini index actually means uh, in a later slide. Uh, so you'll learn what the Gini coefficient is. Um, next, we're going to learn a little bit about terminology about decision trees and how they all work. Uh, that includes doing some definitions. I'm going to show you a one basic decision tree process and draw out a couple of aspects of uh, the syntax of uh, uh, you know, decision trees when you're interpreting a, a tree graph. Uh, so like in the last section, guys, we're only going to go through these kind of like three basic sections for random forest modeling. We're not going to, we're going to talk about cost functions. We're going to talk about how we train our data. Like we split it just like we did before and uh, how we assess these models, uh, what we can do in terms of our assessment from our, or from our, from our model. Is there anything unique about this uh, model as opposed to others in terms of the things that you can interpret? So we're going to look through a couple of those. We're not going to talk about processing at the moment. Uh, we're going to do that in a later section still. And uh, we're going to do our hypothesis section in a later section from that as well. However, um, I, I, you guys should probably still be thinking about this aspect of it throughout the course, because even though we're not going to be doing it explicitly, thinking about how you evaluate when is a good time to use a, uh, a linear regression machine learning model as opposed to a random forest model, these are things that you can actually evaluate at the moment. So uh, even though we're not formally going through it, this top section here is actually super useful and you can probably start to do it in, in your own um, uh, integration of this knowledge. So. Um, First off, why don't we show you what a full decision tree actually looks like? So this is a complicated tree and I'm going to go through it step by step with you guys. But um, this, is, this, is what, this is what a decision tree looks like using the IRIS data set, which is what we used in our past section and in previous sections. Uh, it's trying to determine uh, the, the different types of flowers using different um, uh, features of the IRIS data set. Uh, I'm going to go through this uh, with, with a sketch pad in a moment. I wanted to really just talk, uh, show it to you, show it what it looks like, and then introduce to you a couple of definitions and terms, and then talk about how this is actually generated. So um, first, the, I want to teach you about what node terminology is. So first off, a decision node is a node, it's one of those boxes in the graph I showed above uh, that can split into further subnodes. So um, the, the data that you just saw previous, uh, we have four types of, four features of data in that IRIS data set. 
the length and widths of the flower petals and the flower leaves. And what this model is trying to do is determine the optimal range of length and width for petals and lengths in order to um, uh, classify data, uh, new data that's coming in, okay? So uh, a decision node is where uh, you have some sort of feature that you're making a split, a decision split on, um, that you can uh, split your data across. Uh, so in, in the previous graph, it's any of those boxes that has a box below it, basically, that's connected by a line. Uh, a terminal node is a node that doesn't split. So a lot of the boxes that are at the bottom or at the far left or the far right were terminal nodes. The process of splitting those 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 boxes is what we, we use that term called splitting, and I'll show you in later sections how we actually calculate um, the value of that splitting, so how we evaluate how good that splitting process was. Uh, and pruning is how we also evaluate whether or not we should have actually used that uh, evaluation criteria in the first place to make that decision, whether it was actually accurate in the first place. Um, so with that, guys, I'm going to jump into uh, some syntax drawing to talk, show you what decision nodes and terminal nodes are and how to interpret that figure above. So um, first thing you'll notice here is that we have uh, a, our, our decision node. This is like a root node. Uh, this is uh, first saying at the top that it, it, it is splitting some data from our iris data set into... Uh, two groups where petal length is less than or equal to 2.5. It's telling us a little bit about the Gini coefficient that I'll talk about uh, in the next slide. It's giving a Gini value of 0.66. Um, TLDR for the moment, if you want to know what Gini is, I'll, I'll give you a basic definition. It's a measure of uh, inequality, usually used in income and economic inequality, where zero is perfect uh, equality and one, I believe, is perfect inequality, or yes, I believe that's the direction. It might be the other way around, but we'll go more into that later. Samples is telling us how many data samples it had in or, uh, before making this split. Uh, it's giving some values. We don't need to know too much about this, and it's saying that um, how is it uh, if the petal legs are less than 2.5, then the class uh, should be Satosa, the type of flower. And um, so this here would be our decision node. Um, oops, that's really rough. Decision node. And then this process here that just occurred that created a true and false. Uh, that would be a split. So this is splitting. And then this box here has something going on as well, where it's also a decision node. And this box here is a terminal node. So basically what we can interpret from this box is that if the petal length is less than or equal to 2.5, then uh, it's, prob it, 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 it's probably a Satosa flower. Uh, and there's 30 samples in here, it's split about a third of it, it has a perfectly equitable Gini coefficient. So basically, this decision node is able to optimize to find that only petal, if a petal is less than 2.5, it must be a Satosa, and that there's a terminal uh, break in this. You'll also notice that Satosa is located in, no, uh, in none of the other boxes. So it made a terminal decision to say to, to create that classification. So uh, that feature is going to be really important in making a decision for that class. But to determine between Virginica and Versicolor, it's a lot uh, less clear and a lot more difficult. Uh, so uh, this has no pruning because there's no samples that had any other issues. But you'll see here that like determining Virginica from Versicolor is a lot more difficult. So now petal width at less than or equal to 1.65 has some splits, but there's still lots of Versicolors and Virginicas in both of these sets. So it continues to try and split. In this case, it says that, okay, if the sepal length is less than or equal to 7.1, we have one Virginica like that. And there's a terminal node here saying, okay, well, one piece of data was split out from there. 
Uh, that is how to interpret this graph, guys. I'm going to now describe to you how uh, this decision tree is actually made. So now that you've now you can read it and understand a little bit about how the decision tree is uh, created and what is going on here, I want to show you how it was actually designed. So in order to create a decision tree, remember that we have um, our iris data set, which has four variables, which are the sepal length width and the petal length width. In order to create a decision tree, you can randomly or through some criteria, select one feature to split your data across, to create a decision node across. And you say, okay, well, uh, in this case, all of our features, all of our variables are numbers and not categories, except for the final decision. However, let's say there was color for petal length and or uh, petal and uh, petals and um, sepals, and only um, in they you know they all were green and had different color types. So you could have um, different ty variable types to split across. Uh, you randomly select any of those variables to split, and you say, okay, if it was a categorical variable like that, and you only had red and blue, you could say, oh. Um, uh, we want to split across red and blue and see what the differences in sepal lengths and widths are. Uh, once you do that, once you create that split decision, you then calculate the Gini index uh, for that split. Uh, and that's, you know, sometimes we call these uh, terminal nodes, uh, sometimes we call them decision nodes. Um, so I will show you how to create the Gini, I'll show you the Gini calculation in the next section. Uh, I'm just really trying to, to like, give you a high level explanation of how a tree is made. And so once uh, you calculate the Gini index and you made that split, you now have subsets of data and you can then um, run another kind of split uh, to create more subsets and calculate Gini indexes for those. And basically, um, once you've create, if you create a tree, you'll have some sort of like general Gini value that you can then determine like how good of a decision tree was this? Could I make a different decision tree that is a lot more powerful? Let's spend a little bit of time talking about the cost function, the Gini index and what that specifically means. And then we're gonna uh, cap off this class and we'll talk about the process in the next class. So the cost function for uh, decision trees is this thing called the Gini index, basically I've described it before, it's a measure of, uh, usually used in economics for uh, determining how much wealth is distributed amongst the population. However, it can be used for all different types of things where like, it's like resource distribution, how much of one type of data is associated uh, with one class over another or one group over another, let's say. And so we use the Gini index in our decision trees to, to say like, okay, um, if we have, if we make this split, if we split our data into two different subsets, how equitable is the data across each of these, um, uh, across these sets? So uh, we're always kind of looking for uh, perfect equality, uh, basically that like the subset has all, uh, everyone has the same class uh, for that subset. Um, and if there's inequality, there's like differences everywhere and it's all distributed, uh, we, our decision tree is less accurate. So uh, that's why we use the, the, this formula below here is uh, how, that, how that goes. P uh, is the probability of uh, some event given uh, a decision that's being made. So the event is K, this bar here is a uh, statistics language. You'll see we have our large sigma here. So we have the sum of all um, different, uh, the, uh, the probabilities of these events given a certain type, uh, given a certain decision T that's being made and you subtract by one to turn it into a float that's between zero and one. That's what this whole formula is saying, G is. Uh, G of T here is the Gini index and it's uh, one minus the sum gives you some sort of percentage value for P squared K 
to t, which is the probability of an event given some other piece of information. Uh, in our next section, guys, this will be a lot more clear because I'm going to go through like an actual mathematical example with you, a very simple one, but I wanted to introduce to you all of these high-level concepts. So um, in our next section, we'll do a very basic example of how one decision tree works, and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how you then make a forest from those trees. Okay, guys. Uh, in this class, we learned high-level um, basics of how decision trees are made. We learned how to interpret a decision tree graph and what all that noise is going on in there. We talked a little bit about the Gini index and the cost function for that and some basic terminology of how uh, for uh, when dealing with decision trees. <laughs>